three fantastic speakers, some of the top scientists in the field joining us all from Forest Research. Hugely grateful to them for giving up their time. Uh, starting off with, uh, with, with Max Blake, um, Ips Typographus, uh, then moving on to Nick Fielding to talk about Dendroctinus, and hopefully Sandra uh, then will be with us to talk about oak, um, de oak decline and give us an update on that. So, Max, I can see you're with us. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for giving up your time. And I will stop sharing now. The floor is all yours. Oh, uh, hold on a minute. I maybe just need to allow you to unmute. OK, sorry, that was my fault. Right. Uh, no. OK, so. Right, this is slightly strange, so you can't unmute yourself. And I can't unmute you either. OK, I honestly don't know what's happening here, Max. I um, I can remove you from the meeting, but I cannot unmute you. So uh, so Tracy and Chris, my my help is on this. Could you just try unmuting yourselves? Yeah. OK, John, so I've just done that and I've been looking around to see if there was a standard function so we could um, mute everybody, unmute everybody and try again. I can't find one. I'm looking, okay. but obviously so clearly Matt, I've unmuted myself. Yeah, so... John, who, who started the, the team meeting? It looks like I'm not on mute anymore. Ah, oh, oh, you're not. Hello, okay. Max. Right. So, <laughs> right. Technology solved itself. Sorry right. about that, everyone. Uh, Max. I've loaded teams optimal. often. If you, just, if you just sign out and sign back in again, it solves so many issues. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, right, I'll just uh, start sharing my screen now. Um, does that look okay, John? Can you see that? That looks good and sounds good. Great, excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for inviting me along today. Apologies for the technical issues. Unfortunately, uh, Teams does have a bit of a mind of its own sometimes. Um, my name is Max. I'm the advisory entomologist in Forest Research. Um, so, I'm sort of part of uh, part of Anna Perez's wider team, who I, I believe spoke to you last week. Um, I sort of head up the uh, entomology side of things in advisory um, and then do a lot of plant health work as well, um, mainly revolving around uh, phytosanitary various bits and pieces, which is all sort of statutory uh, import export stuff. Um, and one of the biggest things that we've been working on recently has been sort of typographers. So uh, John invited me along today just to give a quick um, update um, on the eradication program. One thing to say is that um, because this recording is going public, there's an awful lot of stuff I can't talk about. Um, so if I'm a little bit vague or if I'm discussing things that, that uh, perhaps came up a couple of years ago, um, I'm afraid that's uh, for the moment just the way it's got to be. Uh, and, until we can sort this one out. So um, hopefully if there's if there's anything that needs clarifying, we can ask in the questions afterwards. Uh, so let's sort of get on with it. Um, just a brief run through sort of for, uh, conifer forestry itself. Nothing nothing too exciting here, but the the, the main thing to, to point out, and obviously people in the Southwest uh, know this as well as anybody, is that we are really reliant uh, in forestry on non-native conifers. And an awful, awful lot of that is spruce, the further west and the further north you go, the more uh, the more spruce, and in particular, the more of our mainstay crop, which is which is Sitka spruce. So one of the reasons that Sitka grows so well here is that the the usual pests and diseases that knock it back uh, in its natural um, natural range aren't here. And this is one of the reasons we get some very, very good growth, as well as our climate, which we'll get onto in a bit. Um, unfortunately, although we are quite lucky in the UK to have a lot of barriers 
here. Uh, we don't we don't have a very good insect fauna when you compare it uh, to Europe, or not not very good for an entomologist anyway. Um, we have have this sort of climate and a sea barrier, which tends to stop a lot of things from getting over. But we have a colossal um, wood importing regime, mostly from Europe, but from all over the place. And it's not just the importation of wood that's a problem, it's also the importation of wood as a packaging material. So an awful lot of what we um, buy from elsewhere has all got wood packaging associated with it. And this um, makes makes the makes GB very, very susceptible to um, introductions of new novel pests. Which on very, very, very briefly, and the actual numbers of this don't, don't really matter, but it's just to look at how different our climate in the UK is is to else is is to everywhere else. A lot of people just sort of think that we've got the same kind of climate as Europe, and that's about it. But we we really don't. This um, top map we can see is temperature seasonality. So this is the difference between the coldest quarter and the warmest quarter. Purple here is is very very low. So that's that's sort of the most minimal difference. And then the further you go out towards this sort of blue and light green, the the greater the difference. Basically. Even in the sort of the, the 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 hottest, driest parts of the UK, so that the southeast here and then sort of up into uh, sort of parts of East Scotland and, and, and the northeast as well, even those areas are only about as seasonal as North France, Netherlands, Belgium, possibly just up into um, uh, into the north of Germany here. Whereas actually, the rest of the UK, Wales, Southwest Scotland, I, um, and Ireland as well. The seasonality is only about as great as that shown in um, the, the, the most coastal areas possible. This is a very different climate to the rest of Europe. And funnily enough, if you look at where this sort of climate with very low seasonality is also found, um, I don't think you'll surprise too many people to know that it's also the sort of climate that's found in places like Oregon and British Columbia, where we uh, have an awful lot of our giant conifer trees from. In terms of the uh, mean temperature, southwest here, the mean temperature of the warmest quarter is about 14 to 15 degrees Celsius. That's about one degree warmer than the southeast, but actually that's still quite a lot cooler than even places like the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, we are very, very mild in the UK. If, if, we, if we looked at um, the mean temperature in the coldest quarter, again, we'd, we'd be much warmer than most of uh, most of the UK, and it's, it tends to be that it's our very, very mild winters um, which sort of cause insects problems and stop them from really doing very well here, um, rather than our warm summers. A lot of people think that people, you know, that the tropical species can't establish and do well here. Um, they certainly can. They just don't necessarily grow as quickly. Um, and quite often that very, very mild winter can, can lead them susceptible to interpathogenic diseases. Um, so, just that we'd whip through a couple of bits on here. We, we've got a huge um, amount of work that we do um, in, in FR on bark beetles, do a lot of surveillance for new species, monitor new, new establishments, and assess the risk of, of new and novel pests to our various forestry species. To touch briefly on, on sort of the rest of the Ips species, this is, uh, this is an Ips here, this is Ips sembre. Um, Ips are mass attacking beetles. There's this there's a bit of a tendency to call things oh primary or secondary pests. Um, that definition falls down completely. Um, if you really start looking into entomology, an awful lot of species can be one but can become the other or the other way around. And, and it's and it's an oversimplicity to call things primary species, i.e. those that can break past tree defenses um, easily and don't need any kind of stimulus versus secondary species where they need some sort of stimulus to help them get going. So. Here, um, it's generally of this, of this secondary type, so they need um, trees that have been dropped by the wind, that have been attacked by disease, they need very high temperatures. Um, and basically, as they build up in numbers, they switch to this primary attack, where there are so many of them, there is no way that the trees can actually defend themselves. We've got three species established in doing well in the UK. Ipsex dentatus. Um, I really need to update this because protected zones are no longer something that we um, uh, really sign up to, so I'll, I'll, I, I do need to amend that. Um, that's been here for a long time, that's a pine feeding species. Acuminatus is very obscure, um, only really known in the north north of England and Scotland. 
um, but seems really not to be doing very much here. And then finally, Ipsembre, which has done exceptionally well in 2018. Uh, it's very, very wide. It's much more widespread than we ever thought it was. It's a large feeding species. Um, and all of these are sort of widely regarded as being less problematic than Ipsivographus for two reasons. First of all, Ipsivographus um, seems to be one that will switch to that primary mode more often um, and um, without as much uh, in inducement to do so from, from say, um, disease or temperatures. It will just sort of more regularly do it. But that's also partly related to the fact that there's a lot more spruce planted in, in places like Germany, the Czech Republic, and there is of things like large. There's more host plant material there for it to get started on. Um, in terms of what can they do? Well, this is at Sembre. This is in the Midlands. Um, this was uh, sort of in October, if I remember correctly. Larch is beginning to lose its leaves, but we can still see here a number of dead trees which have been killed by killed by larch. This is an older stand. You can see a lot of these have um, lost uh, lost limbs in wind because they've, they've, they've died really quite a while ago. And this is the sort of situation where if you've got lots of larch, lots of pine spruce, it's beginning to die. All of this acts as a nice substrate for if species to get established in, start breeding up, and then they start going on to the other trees here. So this is a younger tree here that's been killed probably in that year um, by Ips. This was relatively large material, about 60 centimetres diameter at breast height, um, and Ips is more than capable of actually going in and killing those sort of things. In terms of its Ips typographus, this is some um, uh, photographs from the Czech Republic in summer 2019. And basically everything in, in this photograph in particular that's green isn't a spruce. Um, we can see here at the front these sort of slightly orange touched spruce were from last year. These red ones sort of over in the distance here, that's where the sort of current front of this of, of this particular outbreak had got to in that year. Um, it's very, very nasty. And, and the reasons that the Czech Republic has been so badly hit by by it recently a, a, a multitude and they're not really reasons that we uh, in the UK would, would necessarily would necessarily be applicable but they are still um, worth noting and one of those in particular is planting Norway spruce outside of its native range on uh, lowland habitat in particular is is well leads it very very um, at risk uh, of, of its typographers getting a, getting established and attacking because of the risk of ifs to our forestry industry uh, industry here. We've been surveying for it yearly since the early 90s, since what used to be called our protected zone as of the 1st of January. This was uh, now our pest free area for the species. Uh, and this uses billets and um, ips pheromones to cover the entirety of the UK. The areas that are surveyed are a nice balance between areas where ips might be more likely to come in. So these would be, say, wood importers. Um, or ports, just what, what were known as ports, piers and processors, but also areas where Ips would have the greatest impact. So there's a lot of work in Scotland. We don't necessarily think that Ips typographus would establish itself in Scotland first, although um, the fact that Ips sembrae and Ips sextantatus did establish themselves in Scotland first in the UK does give some sort of evidence that it might that they might do. Um, but that's where it would have the greatest impact, and also in the southwest and Wales as well. So it's quite a nice big network. We then unexpectedly found 41 adults, originally two, and then we um, went down and had a, had a better look and found another 39 uh, in Kent. We started surveying the area, found a lot of galleries on some wind throw here. And then after quite a lot of, quite a lot of touring and throwing, did, did a lot of surveying around. Um, and it turned out that this was sort of the, the, the end of a large, well, small actually, fairly small component of wood, uh, Norway spruce, which was in this uh, larger forest. And after a lot of surveying, um, a lot of work, we managed to find that about 25 trees have been infested, some of which have been killed that summer. The site itself looked like this. This was all in, uh, this was about December now. A lot of standing, healthy trees, very widely spaced. We can see from the um, uh, from the size of the crowns here that these have been spaced, uh, widely spaced for a long time. But you can see material that's come down here in a recent storm. There's another root plate over here. So there was a lot of material for it to get established on. Um, and it, it, it was sort of the ideal condition. We can see here again, more, re uh, more recent trees that have died. Um, this has still got foliage on it. 
versus these two trees here were somewhat older, and an even older Winthrow here, and another one at the back there. So it was sort of the perfect storm, really. It was an ideal situation for us to get established in. Lots more boat across the video. So um, we started splitting the region into zones. Um, this was relatively straightforward, but it's worth pointing out the actual area that this covered. You know, this 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 was massive. We were surveying sites in Essex from an outbreak sort of down in South Kent, um, and it's worth saying that all of our actions were um, basically controlled by the Ips Typographus uh, contingency plan. We did um, go off piste a number of times in that where we realised that actually some things in that weren't useful or we came up with better ideas on how to do things. So we need to amend this um, in due course once we've actually managed to uh, manage to declare eradication. And we also have a statutory instrument Labour port before Parliament to allow us to impose movement controls in this area uh, and let us sort of get on and try and do our job as best as possible. And that came in in force in, in January 2019. One of the things that was done as part of this was a lot of helicopter flying. Um, spruce in the southeast is very, very patchy. There's lots of little blocks of it uh, knocking about, and quite often they're hidden from ground surveying. So, 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 so actually the fastest way to do it is just to get into a helicopter. And we can see here there's this little block of, or this sort of disparate block of Norway spruce here that's been uh, sort of hidden by all this broadleaf. This was then followed up on the ground, usually six to 12 actually in here, probably fewer than that because there aren't that many trees. Uh, and in this case, this was uh, this was all dendroctinus, which Nick will be talking about in a bit. We clear felled almost all of the spruce, but we were aware that there would be ips overwintering um, in the leaf litter. So they so some of them emerge from the leaf, from from the trees when they are sort of um, mature adults in say sort of September October, drop down into the leaf litter and um, hibernate over there. So we knew there'd be an awful lot of these that we needed to mop up. So we put out um, a couple of traps, um, which was about 140 traps uh, across this site in a big grid pattern. And we also left some of these Norway spruce standing. Um, and we'll get onto those in a second. These were then left um, to be felled later in spring. So we, we knew that it was probably going to take maybe two or three months to complete its life cycle here after um, the adults had emerged and started attacking trees. So we knew we had a bit of time, a little bit of a window to allow it to attack, and then we could go in and fell these trees. We basically wanted to make sure that there was material around um, for them to feed on, rather than encouraging them to, to fly off and try and find um, other material there. So all of these traps were emptied weekly um, in 2020 and uh, sorry, in, in 2019 and 2020, and we're slightly changing that for this year. We sort of trying to drop that down to fortnightly, uh, and we'll sort of discuss on that one. But we need two years worth of zero catches to declare eradication. So this hopefully is going to be our last year of the project. Um, as you can see, for obvious reasons, I've, I've taken off the units on this one. But once we started getting our first temperatures above 20 degrees C, this is when it's really started flying. And we've got this absolutely colossal peak. Um, 2019 was a funny year, a lot of a lot of strange temperatures. It was, it was a very spiky year for for that. It wasn't very consistent. We then had um, a lot of um, uh, sort of small numbers of catches as temperatures dropped then for a bit back up again, see the rest of those catches. And then that's how it remained for the rest of the year. Just very, very, very small numbers um, coming in here. In 2020, the pattern was completely different. Um, we caught very, very few um it's across the site um and that didn't seem to be related to any kind of uh any kind of material on the site um, largely because we've removed all the spruce there but there were some concerns that it might start breeding in the pine if it got desperate uh, which they which they can do but there's no evidence of that uh, certainly from last year's data and hopefully that will remain the case for the next year as well um so we sort of looked at some other methods as well we used um, billets, billet piles, um, which were really, really useful actually. We used this to sort of monitor development and see how quickly they'd be able to get through their life cycle here. We kept a regular eye on these after we knew that they'd um, done this mass uh, swarming flight um, at that period where we had that big peak. We then went back to them about six weeks later and found all sorts of quite a lot of larvae there, but they hadn't managed to develop into adults, which was great. So we hadn't made things even worse. And we sort of assessed those and managed to burn those. 
We also did a lot of work on those trap trees, so we, we ring barked these. Um, and we, we actually ring barked these back in um, back into the January, well before um, this this first flight happened. Unfortunately, the resin pressure on these was so high. Um, we even found a couple of areas where Dendroctinus had been repelled by um, uh, by the by the resin pressure, and they didn't actually remove any yips. So we wouldn't be doing that again. We should have just felled those straight off. Going more widely out, um, we set up a large network of um, pheromone traps here. So these are cross vein traps put up in a woodland. If it's typical for pheromone in here, insects come along, bump into the side, drop down to the um, preservative down here. Um, and we basically wanted to know, although we've done an awful lot of surveying, 100 sites have been done by April without any evidence of any further infestations, we wanted to know if there was anything we'd missed. Um, it can be very difficult to find things like hips when they're at very, very low numbers in a woodland. Although it's okay and it looks very obvious when there's an awful lot of them, when there's only a couple, it, it really is difficult. So we decided to set these up largely as a monitoring system to see if there are any sites that we'd missed. Um, the good news is that um, although we caught quite a lot of hips in these, we haven't found any evidence of other establishments. Again, I've, I've removed um, any of the units from here, but we can sort of see how far out they go. And basically yellow and red means, yes, we caught quite a few hips here. Um, but again, a lot of the, these have all been, every single site has been followed up uh, at least twice, tree, uh, tree material felled, absolutely no evidence of breeding. But where they're coming from and how they arrive is actually very difficult to prove. It's very tempting to look at this and say, ah, they're, they're coming from over here, but how they come over here and how regularly they do so and what's what's driving them over um, is the difficult thing because it's very difficult to rule out, um, say, vectoring um, on uh, as, as hitchhikers. Um, obviously, there's an awful lot of traffic that flows between these two ports. Very difficult to look at that. Um, and it's also surprisingly difficult to look at, um, say, natural dispersal through wind. So, um, 2021, all continuing despite the restrictions, um, because the, the, the existence of Ipstipographus is a potential barrier to trade. In last year, it came down very quickly from government that this was something that needed to continue immediately, um, and there were to be as few interruptions as possible. Um, despite all the COVID restrictions, what we could do. So this is this is great. Um, but we're now switching. We've got one more year of field trapping. Hopefully, touch wood, of course, if, if before we can declare eradication. And we're now shifting towards a longer term management strategy because spruce in the southeast is really not growing in its optimum, optimum environment. It's very, very scruffy. There's a lot of ex Christmas tree plantations that have just been left to do their thing. But we now think if there's a regular input of beetles coming over him here, we need a longer term strategy to try and remove spruce in the southeast to stop it getting in, established and then spreading out into the areas where it could really cause damage. And we have seen this. We have seen landowners already beginning uh, as a response to its typographers to take out spruce. Uh, this was spruce, that I think, was, was, was due for its uh, was due for a thin and the decision was made simply to clear fell it uh, rather than con continue that for its full rotation. This was a site um, which was actually rather close to our eradication site, which had a good amount of spruce on it. It also caught quite a large number of beetles. We weren't really sure where they came from. We felt an awful lot of material over for in, in here over two years, never found any evidence of breeding. Um, we, we just couldn't quite pin this one down. The landowner decided to fell it. We went in and inspected every single stem of spruce. Uh, that was on the ground and found absolutely no evidence of breeding, um, which is great news because this was a rare opportunity to go in and sort of prove to ourselves that it definitely wasn't here. And that actually, yes, you know, going out and sampling half a dozen of the most suspicious trees in a site is sufficient for us to be able to prove that there isn't actually, um, or give, give us very good evidence that there isn't breeding here. So that was quite satisfying. Um, I just thought I'd quickly end by sort of touching on um, if, if it's typographers, which I've spelt incorrectly up here, sorry. Um, I haven't noticed that before. We're doing a lot of work looking at um, detection yeah. and the response to if typographers oh, oh. as sort of a model for other things, and then also assessing the suitability of Sitka spruce. So we've already made a lot of changes in the way that we um, would um, 
look for bark beetle pests, having learned an awful lot from Eve's, Eve's eradication. Um, and we'll be improving that contingency plan. Spruce suitability is an interesting one. We're the only country which, sort of outside of, outside of the um, of America, well, Canada, um, which uses Sitka spruce to any significant degree, although it is grown in other places like Norway. And as such, there's not much known about Sitka and Norway spruce. Sitka and Norway spruce, both, of course, are spruces, but they're very different within that. Um, they, they, they aren't very closely related within Picea, and th th there are all sorts of reasons why Ips may do worse on the Sitka, but there are also reasons why Ips may do better on Sitka. And um, from some work from my colleagues uh, Dagan Inwood and Katie Reed, it looks like there's no difference in preference here between the tree, two tree species, but there's potential for lower breeding success. But this could then be knocked out by sort of generational effects. So Ips that breed on Sitka might prefer and breed better on Sitka in their next generation. But this is uh, this is really preliminary stuff. Uh, there's a lot more work to do on this, um, and uh, yeah, this that's all still sort of ongoing there. Um, so uh, I just thought I'd say just a quick thanks to everybody there. If there's any questions, we could sort of go through a few here now. But please, um, please, please do feel free to email me. Um, thank you very much for coming. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Max. Um, there's no questions yet, um, but are you okay to hang around uh, for a little bit? Because then we'll take some questions at the end, or do you need to? No, nope, that's absolutely fine. I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be here for the whole thing. Okay. Uh, if you could just stop sharing your screen, um, that great. I think there was a hand popped up. I didn't see who it's from, and it, Matthew Brown. If you could. Yeah, just unmute yourself and uh, and ask your question. Thanks very much for a really helpful presentation, Max. Um, I didn't quite keep up with the, uh, the the interesting discussion at the beginning about why our climate is not so favourable for these beetles. But um, my question is whether climate change is likely to make this problem better or worse. I think it's probably going to make it worse overall. Um, it depends which sort of model you look at and which aspect of sort of Ips biology um, we sort of we sort of be concerned about there. Truth is, you know, hotter, drier summers, colder, wetter winters, colder, wetter winters in particular aren't going to do spruce any good. Um, we know it doesn't like like that. It's you know generally a species that's adapted to cold, dry winters under a lot of snow. That's not going to do it any good on on the main site for instance you know we saw that the root plate of these spruces was incredibly um uh it was, it was incredibly short because they were going into waterlogged clay um that's not great and that's going to leave them very susceptible to to, to withdraw ips um it's going to absolutely love that sort of thing i think it probably is going to make it worse high temperatures through summer is going to possibly lead it to having two generations a year here potentially, if it were allowed to establish. Um, I, th I think as the climate becomes more and more like sort of continental Europe, and we know they have big outbreaks there, yeah, I think that's certainly something that we need to worry about. That's really helpful, thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, so there might be one or two more questions. Pop them in the chat if you can, uh, but we'll now move on to our second speaker, who is uh, Nick Fielding, also from Forest Research. So, Nick, if you are able to unmute yourself and share your screen, hopefully you're still there. Hopefully you can now hear me. I can hear you, Nick. Yep. Well, that's a good start then. So <laughs> now let's try and start share my screen, wherever it is. Uh, I think it's that one. Do, 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 do. That's looking great, Nick. I looking good. I can so... hear you. Over to you. Right. Um, let's go back there. OK. Can everybody see that all right? Yeah, Good. Um, well, hi. My name is Nick Fielding. Um, like Max, I work, I'm one of the entomologists who works for Forest Research. Um, I'm slightly different in that I'm based up I've been Ludlow in Shropshire, and I am the Tree Health Field Support Officer for basically the whole of the UK. And I've been working on, on Dendrochnus since it was first discovered many, many moons ago. It feels like in my entire career, basically. Okay. 
Um, Dendrochnus spikens, the great European spruce bark beetle. What is it? Um, it's an aggressive tree killing bark beetle. Um, we don't have many. In fact, it's one of the very few aggressive bark beetles that we have in this country. It's um, most of the beetles that we have tend to be part of, if you like, the rot down process. Um, whereas something like Dendrochnus can come along and actively will kill a tree, which is why it's aggressive. Breeds in Norway spruce. It breeds in spruce, Norway being the preferred host. Uh, but having said that, it doesn't really mind what species it goes into. It's found throughout uh, Northern Europe and Asia. Um, it started its life, for want of a better phrase, over um, at the far side of, of Russia, on the eastern end, um, just above the Sakhalin Peninsula, which is the bit that hangs down um, above Japan. And part of the population moved westwards and became Dendrochnus mycans. Part of the population moved eastwards into Canada and became Dendrochnus punctatus. Those two species are quite distinct from other Dendrochnus in that they don't tend to produce a gallery. I mean, Max showed you pictures of um, gallery systems uh, where you have a central mother gallery and, and radiating arms coming from it. Dendrochnus mycans, and for that matter, punctatus, do not produce that. They just produce a mess. They feed haphazardly and, and uh, as they go through the tree. Anyhow, Dendrochnus is found throughout Northern Europe and Asia, as I said, and it is now found uh, throughout Wales, majority of England, uh, and has recently been found in Southwest Scotland. Um, in the, the main area of concern within England now is the southwest um, because it's it's established itself throughout the rest of the country and I'll get on to control in a bit and, and you'll understand why the, the, the West Country is now our area of concern. Um, it's now in um, uh, moved into Scotland. Hang on, we go back a bit. Doo -doo -doo. Somebody got control of me. No, I'm sorry. It's moved into Scotland, into the southern parts of Scotland, and um, is is beginning to get head towards what is known as the pest-free area uh, up in Scotland. So quite a lot of. Have you lost my screen? Yes, Nick. It's I've lost your screen. I can still hear you. Right, let's try and get it back. <laughs> OK, can see it again. You're back on the first slide there. Right. OK, let's find my way through. Is that tape showing the whole screen? That Yeah, so that's the good slide view there. That's exactly what we need right. to see. OK, where are we? Uh, right. Um, where was I? It was here, wasn't it? That's right. So, in, in we're concerned in Scotland, but um, for the majority of you who've linked into this, that's not going to be a, a, a pressing concern at the moment. So we'll sort of gloss over that one. Okay. So what does it do? It always attacks and breeds in living trees. Again, this is separates it out from the other bark beetles that um, we, we we're commonly aware of in that it goes into and only attacks living trees. Stressed or weakened trees are no more susceptible to beetle attack than healthy trees. But damage on the trees, for instance, say a wound after a thinning operation, uh, damage where the tree starts to occlude over that damage is an area that had, if the beetle does choose to pick on, it will certainly initiate attack more successfully. And the great thing about Dendrochnus, if you like, is that single premated females initiate successful attack. Unlike species such as Ips that Max was talking about, mass attack is not necessary. Within the life cycle of, of the beetle, um, you, you, once emergence takes place, um, not emergence, but once they emerge from the pupae, 
uh, and they sit under bark for a while. That is the point at which mating takes place. Males are extremely rare. Sex ratios about 1 to 40, 1 to 50. So that would make it very difficult for them to find uh, the, the males and the females to get together naturally. So by mating whilst they're still in the tree, they can ensure that that all females are, are pre-mated. So that when the female moves on, she is ready to go and attack um, a tree and lay her eggs. So outbreaks build up slowly uh, before they spread from the original focus. The, the, what tends to happen is, is a tree will be attacked, the beetles will fly in when conditions are right, i.e. the temperatures above about 22, 23 centigrade, not something that happens commonly, but they, they build up slowly and quite often the, the beetles will walk from tree to tree through the branches. So you get this spread that, that tends to be a hot spot. The life cycle takes 12 to 24 months, commonly in this country about 18 months, but there is always overlap of generations going on. A lot depends on when the eggs are laid. The eggs are laid at the end of the season, sort of um, September, October time, they tend to overwinter as, as eggs, and that adds six months to the life cycle quite easily. And breeding behaviour, as I said, is strongly dependent on beetles flying at temperatures over 20, which, as I said earlier, is not something you find commonly in a, particularly in an unthin spruce plantation. So what can we do about it? Uh, we identify and survey for the pest. Um, that, that has all sorts of um, ways that can happen. It, it can happen yeah, by, by, by owners. By owners going in uh, and looking at, at their trees and, and finding a problem and getting in touch with us. It can be done at the other end of the scale, again, like Max mentioned, by the helicopter flights that are regularly done by our colleagues in Plant Health, who can then detect dead trees, dead tops of trees. Um, and and that's that's another way we pick it up. So what can we do? We can reduce the pest by non-biological means, such as sanitation felling. Early on, when we first found the pest, a lot of sanitation felling was done. But it, it's a difficult position for us because if if an owner or, or an agent or anybody, for that matter, goes in and, and fells all the infected trees within a woodland, we then cannot pursue our biological control, biological control program because we need uh, dendrochmus to be present in order to get the, the predator Rhizophagus grandis established within that wood. And I tend to tell people that in the main what we want to do is um, keep as many dendrochmus on the site as we can to start with because it increases our chances of getting Rhizophagus established. Then once we have, we can monitor the, the impact of the predator uh, in the wood. Um, and hopefully within a few years, you'll notice that you do not see as many symptoms of dendrochmus micans. Anyhow, what are the symptoms? We get long distance symptoms. I've described what you can see from, from the air. You can see just looking at a crop in general from a distance away. You can see um, dead trees. Um, you can see dead tops. Initially, if it's only a small attack, you, you can see dead branches. But when you look closer, you see the in the main, the resin tubes. The resin tube is produced by the female beetle as she bores into the tree. I suppose in about 99% of cases, um, the spot she chooses for her initial attack is just below a branch node. Just below a branch node is a patch of bark that is, it's not dead, but it has an extremely low resin pressure. And um, it's an area in which she can get, get going, if you like, with her, with her, her egg chamber. So she uses her body a bit like a piston and pushes out the resin and the frass and such like uh, 
as she bores her way into the tree. And so you get these tubes, and they vary dramatically in size from a couple of centimetres, if the resin pressure is low, they can be the size of your fist if it's a if it's a really resinous tree. And if it's at ground level, you get this um, this frass, very granular frass mixture, small resin tube and a very granular mix sitting on the ground. The colour of that tube varies dramatically. I mean, if it if it's old, they tend to be a sort of grey colour. But if they're fresh and soft. They vary in colour from white, which is just pure resin and tends to indicate that the beetle has really done nothing other than get to the cambium, through to a, a deep purpley brown. Now, most people will be aware that when you, if you're marking a spruce for a thinning, let's say, and you're slashing the trees, you put a blaze on them. Uh, and that blaze starts off lovely and white and within a matter of minutes has turned to a purpley color. That's the same reaction you get on this, this resin tube. As, the, as the, the chemicals oxidize, it changes color. So that idea that, that you, you can look at the, the, those tubes, if they're that color, you can see that the, uh, the beetle has got to the cambium and is, is starting to breed within that tree. The brood area under bark varies dramatically, but in the main, if there is no control present, the brood area can run perhaps four feet up the tree and, and be about one foot to one foot six wide. So it's taken out a very considerable area of bark. In the main, that is usually survivable by the tree, but if when it comes to the end of its life cycle and it's ready to emerge, the weather conditions are not right for it to fly or to move, those beetles can just initiate fresh attack at the side of the brood in which they were, uh, they, they, they were bred themselves. In that case, that's when you quite regularly get the two, those two broods, one from either side, meeting up at the back of the tree, killing off the tree's plumbing and basically killing the tree. It's as simple as that. It kills the tree by girdling it, and that's it. So what can we do? We've talked a bit. I've mentioned briefly the Prelita rhizophagus grandis. There are several species of rhizophagids in this country. Unfortunately for us, from the word go, uh, grandis was not one of them. But grandis has developed in a very specific relationship um, with with dendrochnus, the two species have, have almost co-evolved. Rhizophagus grandis cannot exist without dendrochnus mycans, um, which means it's ideal for, for a control program. When we first found dendrochnus in, uh, in the UK, we were aware of, of the potential of this uh, predator and very quickly linked with colleagues on the continent and managed to get permission to bring them in and to um, to start a breeding program in this country, which we've done ever since. Um, they are quite different in size. Um, quite often when I'm going out to release this predator, people, people sort of imagine that it's going to be something that can grab dendrochnus by the scruff of the neck and sort of fling it around. It's not. It's a much smaller beetle. It's a um, much narrower uh, and altogether considerably smaller. But it has the potential to seriously kick dendrochnus, for want of a better phrase. So as I say, there are 12 species of rice of Egidi in the UK. And mostly found under tree bark or in decaying plant and animal matter. Uh, I found a reference to a, a Victorian book that suggested that the best place was to look in drains for them. So that's one of the they they live on sort of rotting matter. Anyhow, it is a specific predator and the most significant natural enemy of dendrochnus. Some work was done. Uh, in Canada to see if we could get that established on Dendrochnus punctatus, as they both have a very similar uh, behavior and, and life cycle, but it didn't it didn't take on at all. It wasn't interested. 
So it seems to be totally specific to, to dendrochnus micans, which probably aided us dramatically in getting hold of um, uh, the um, the predator and getting permission for us to, to release it. Rhizophagus will never kill 100% of any dendrochnus outbreak. What it, it does is it lowers the population to a level where the damage caused is sustainable by the host tree. As I said before, when, when it's sort of full stretch, if you like, uh, and, a, and a large brood, it can kill a very large area of the trunk. Um, whereas what we're aiming for with the predator is an area that's probably no bigger than the palm of your hand, which is something that the tree can very easily sustain uh, and doesn't really cause it any significant issues. Those of you who've, who are aware of dendrochnus know that the larvae, when they're feeding, feed side by side uh, along a common feeding front. Um, um, and you see in the picture here, you've got the, the, all those larvae sitting side by side, sort of munching relatively happily as they go on. They secrete a chemical known as a chiromone, which, which keeps them together as a unit, keeps them feeding together. It uh, sort of controls them, them within the, in the brood area. Rhizophagus detects this chemical and can use it to, to find the dendrochnus brood. So it detects it initially with the, the little hairs on its antennae, and it detects the chemical that it smelled. But, I suppose this is the big but, the female predator must physically touch host larvae before she can lay any eggs. This gives us major problems in trying to rear the predator. If, if we didn't have that, we could probably re rear, it in, it, rear it artificially, but we can't. So we're always on the lookout for the endrochnus larvae because we need them to start the process rolling. Anyhow, the number of eggs laid by the female rhizophagus is determined by the strength of that chiromone. So she knows to lay enough to knock out 90, 95% of the brood, but not to completely eradicate it. Because if it completely eradicated it, it wouldn't have a source of food in the future. Right, Fagus adults will eat any dendrochnus that they find, eggs that they find. Um, but if they, if they find larvae, they lay their eggs among the larvae. The adult beetles stay with the eggs and wound the dendrochnus larvae as their own larvae hatch. This enables the young predator larvae to overcome the thick skin of the host. And you can see in the picture there that you get this mass attacking of um, one dendrochnus larvae at a time. And, and they just feed in there and then they move on as they go. And once they're about halfway through their life cycle, they're more than capable of uh, burrowing into the larvae and, and um, eating the contents. Something lovely for your lunchtime delectation, that. So the larvae mass attack their host, leaving only empty skins. The rhizophagus are mass reared under controlled conditions, and we, we can get a generation through in 100 days from adult to adult. Um, in the wild, Dendrochnus normally takes, as I said, sort of about 18 months on average in a life cycle. During that time, in the, in the natural conditions, you would probably get three generations of rhizophagus on its own. We can slightly speed that up in the laboratory. Females lay up to 250 eggs. As I said, the number of eggs being governed by the strength of the chiromane. And we release those predators in batches of 50 beetles into infected sites. Um, if they're, if they're very heavily infected sites, we increase the number of beetles that we release. Um, people can get in touch with me through, um, you can find me on the website uh, and we can, we can put those into the program um, and try and treat them as soon as we can. Last year, unfortunately, due to the restrictions with COVID, we didn't manage to get to as many sites as we'd hoped to, but hopefully we'll catch up on those. And as it says there, it usually takes about three years to become fully efficient. 
and to notice a drop in the number of attacked trees. Um, and that's basically what the program aims to achieve. So if you have concerns, um, you can always get in touch with me. Let me know um, where you are, who you are, what the woodland is like, and, and we can add it into the program. And that basically is all I've got to say on that. So if anybody wants to ask questions, um, we can go with it from there. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, excellent presentation there. Uh, we've had two questions on a very similar theme. So I'm going to invite uh, John Pope. Would you like to just put your question to, uh, to Nick? If you unmute yourself. If you're still there. Okay, well, I'll, I'll ask. The, I'll ask. The, I'll put the question to Nick anyway. So, Nick, we're encouraged always to leave um, sort of dead trees for the biodiversity reasons. But what would your view be about retaining dead spruce? Yeah, I get asked this quite a lot. I think once the tree is dead, the beetle will not go into it anymore. So it's not going to. It's not going to make it any worse by leaving it there from from a point from that point of view you could say at the stage when it's just before it's dead um it might be better to to take them down but i think on the whole if we can get the predator established it doesn't really matter if you've got some dead trees present within that woodland great thank you very much uh i think that was about the only question there, or there was one from earlier I spotted uh, but I think this was during Max's talk about how we identify IPS um, but I think you you were pretty clear it's just a dead tree I think is, is the single biggest uh, so okay I think what we'll do John, now do you want me to jump in oh, there quickly yeah Max please do yeah cool um so yes a, a, a dead tree is one good way of looking for it, but there's sort of, yeah, a fair few um, other sort of signs and symptoms that would help. Um, we sort of saw briefly pictures of the galleries there. Ips Typograph has created this very, very distinctive gallery, um, which has always got this um, sort of vertical, what we call a maternal gallery, which is bored by a female. And then from that, the larvae radiate out sort of around the tree. So. It's, it's a very, very distinctive gallery, um, vertical to the tree. You'll, you'll, you'll probably first of all notice exit holes um, on, on a sort of a dead or dying tree. Um, if you can get a piece of, uh, sorry, if, if you can get a, a, a piece of bark off, somehow you can chisel or something like that, you can sort of pop it off um, and have a look at it. You'll, you'll see the shape of the gallery there. You tend to see a lot of woodpeckers associated with both um, Dendrogenus and Ips and other bark beetles, they can take off large panels of bark as well. Um, there's a really nice photograph that Mick Biddle has just put up in the chat there of Ips galleries, so you can see the vertical vertical maternal galleries and all the larvae coming off that. It doesn't really matter how many Ips are in there, they will always produce this sort of gallery system. It's, it's really quite distinctive. It's probably worth saying that if there are any concerns if you've got sort of concerns about galleries that you found in your woodland or, or, or dying spruce um, you can always submit a report uh, through tree alert which will come to uh, me and the wider team and we can sort of advise you on what that would on what that would be but i think the key thing as nick said is is that generally it's um not dead spruce you have to worry about it's dying spruce Great, thank you, Max. Um, and Mick's been putting some stuff into the chat with some uh, identifying guides there. Uh, Chris, you've got your hand up. Did you want to come in? Yeah, it was just just a question to Max and Nick, really, obviously very quick. Um, any thoughts on mixtures? Uh, you know, I was quite interested. I didn't realise dendroctonus sometimes just walked across um, to other tree, or most of the time walked across. Um, would you know is, is the problem monocultures uh, as well as unhealthy trees? So I take that one. Uh, you can do Nick, go for it. Yeah, I mean, I think 
we've got without getting into too long a discussion on this um we've all we're all aware that the more climates are altering the more susceptible certain tree species are um to attack by diseases and pests so i, I think it, you know it's it's fairly well documented and fairly well understood that we're better off looking certainly towards the future and and going away from monocultures into mixes because at least if something dramatic comes in and and knocks out a large proportion of the crop you're you, you could still potentially have something left uh, you will always i think because the majority of forestry is now mechanized whatever we do we're going to have spruce next to spruce at some point which is going to allow us a a, w a method by which the beetles can move from one tree to the next um but yet i mean i would tend to say to you yes i would always tend to go nowadays more to a a, a mixture of species than a monoculture great thank you guys um it's it's yeah i think time to introduce our third speaker i know there are still one or two little quick questions going so um, if you could put your questions, if you have them in the chat, and we'll see if we have time for them at the end. But uh, if I could now invite Sandra Denman to, to join us. Hello, I, I'm here, John. Can Hello, you welcome. Me? Hello. I can see you and hear you very well. So, uh, yeah, the floor's all yours. All right. Well, uh, let me first attempt to, to share my screen with you all. Um, And you can just give me the uh, nod when you're seeing this. Are you seeing this? I'm seeing that, yeah. If you just put it into the slide view. Yeah, I think it's taking a little slow. No, ah, there we go. Perfect. That's good. Okay, brilliant. Perfect. Well, John, firstly, thank you so much for, um, you know, asking me to, to give a presentation today. And uh, thanks to everyone for attending. I mean, this is just fabulous numbers. Um, but what I really want to do before I even get started is I want to congratulate you on holding these uh, Lunch and Learn seminars. It is just such an inspired idea. And, uh, you know, as we've all got teams and this facility available to us, it's really enabled us to have an enormous uh, outreach. And I just think that this is should really become a permanent feature of a, you know, of, of activity that we have within our industry. So, so big congratulations on that. Now, uh, moving on from that, then some of you will know that we had a webinar yesterday, which was geared all at our sort of wider Forestry Commission family. And so some of you may have attended that. So I'd ask you to bear with me in parts where there's overlap, but I have tried to uh, introduce a new area. And so my talk today is going to be focused really on predisposition factors, uh, specifically with regard to AOD and resilient oak. I just want to bring you up to speed with some of the work that, that we've been doing. Um, but just last comment on yesterday's webinar, that was recorded and so that will be uh, available in time um, and so anybody that's interested in receiving the link to that recording please please feel free to uh, email me or sally simpson who's our aod project support officer and we will gladly send you that link Okay, no further ado then. So uh, today's talk is really about predisposition uh, and oak trees. And I've put up two slides here, uh, two halves of this one slide. You, on the left hand side, you'll see there are multiple panels of different oak trees suffering from acute oak decline. But do notice that in the last two panels, there are trees that are suffering from chronic oak decline. And we have undertaken this work on uh, both of these forms of oak decline, but today I'll be talking more about acute oak decline. 
And so I just really wanted to draw the uh, difference uh, in your mind between a primary disease and a decline disease. So a primary disease is really defined as a continuous irritation which causes a deviation from the normal functioning of the host and it often has detrimental effect to the host if not being lethal. Uh, technically we know that there are two main forms of disease and those are infectious or biotic diseases that are caused by biotic agents and then there are non-infectious or abiotic causes. Now, traditionally, um, plant, plant disease, oops, I seem to have lost the screen there. Yeah, sorry, I think, I think Nick's just started sharing his screen again. Oh. Nick, <laughs> Nick, if you can he hear me, I think possibly you need to, Okay, so <laughs> do I need to share again? I probably I think, do. I think you will need to. Uh, while while you're just doing that, if I could ask a Richard Claxon to turn your camera off. There's been a bit in the chat saying we can see you, and it's uh, slightly distracting. Okay, Sandra, that's great. I can see okay, you. Okay, done it. Thank you. <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> right. Oh, right. Okay, right. So to just pick up from from where we were. So traditionally, we've used this um, disease triangle model to explain how primary diseases uh, take hold. And you can see there that they are dynamic systems where you have an interaction between the pathogen, the host and the environment. And in order for this uh, a disease to take place, all three of these factors actually have to come together in a favorable way for the disease to, to take hold. However, when it comes to decline diseases, this model is a little bit lacking. It doesn't really describe the temporal aspects of pathosystems. So in other words, what happens over time, it's very short on detail. And rather importantly, it doesn't take into account essential interactions of uh, microbial interactions that are fundamental to pathobiomes. So what I mean by this is that our work um, in AOD, as you'll see a little later, involves a suite of bacterial pathogens and these, these bacteria actually each contribute something to cause that disease, but we've also got the uh, interaction of agrilis. And so during the 80s, in fact, I think the, 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 the whole concept of decline diseases was first coined in about the 1960s by a, an American pathologist called Sinclair. But really, it was popularized by um, a chap called Paul Magnon in the 1980s. And he put together this disease spiral model where he quite clearly shows that you've got three distinct phases. Phase one is the predisposing phase. Phase two is the inciting phase, or in fact, a tipping phase. And phase three tends to involve the biotic agents, and that's called a contributing phase. Now, here we've, our work has added all the bits in green. And so what we've done is we're starting to flag up a lot more seriously the role of time and the passage of time. We're flagging up in the predisposing uh, factors. As you can see previously, soils was a major, a major element. And today we're going to be talking about soils, but also air pollution is there. Uh, what he has, what Magnon said is in the tipping factors, drought would be an element. And in our backstop project, which we're just undertaking now, we're going to look at drought to get empirical data on that. But again, air pollution is there, uh, events of defoliation and so on. But we've also flagged up the human element here and management history and people's attitudes are really important. Uh, we've brought into the biotic arena the story with bacteria and pathobiomes where you've got more than one organism. And of course, there would also be underpinning root health 
and microbiomes. So those are the complete microbial aspect that go with actually whole trees, uh, but you know, in this particular case with the roots. So this model of Manions is strictly speaking the model we've been working to. It's a lot more complex than the disease triangle and it introduces the elements of time, the dynamic disease systems, our work in particular is showing the linkages across these different factors. And as you'll see, uh, scale, we found out that scale is quite an important consideration. Aha, now it seems to have frozen on me. Um, I might have to escape this, I think. Okay, maybe just, yeah, turn the powerpoint off and turn it back on again yeah i i might i might just do that do you think i should just stop sharing and start sharing again it's worth a try i think so let me do that okay i'll start sharing again uh right let's see if we can jump straight to that one uh whoops where are we <laughs> uh what are you seeing now so I'm seeing your PowerPoint and we've got the next slide on. So that's... Is, that, is that in slide mode now? Yep, that looks good. Oh, perfect. Perfect. OK, right. Apologies for the, <laughs> for the slight disruptions here. OK, so uh, so within the wider oak decline complex, I just wanted to uh, mention that at the moment uh, here in the UK, and I think it's pretty much accepted in, in Europe, uh, we can see that there are two distinctive forms of oak decline within this wider complex. There will definitely be more forms of it. Um, and acute oak decline is, is the one that my team and I have worked on for the last 12 years and really have made significant progress in understanding this decline and actually are uh, leading in, in knowledge on this topic. The second uh, one, so those are what you can see, uh, you know, in the top panel. For those of you that are not um, very aware of the symptoms, they are characterized by these quite distinctive sort of vertical weeps. In severe cases, they're very diagnostic on the trees. If you open up those panels, but you have to open right down onto that cambial interface, you have to expose that phloem sapwood uh, interface and there you will see the uh, galleries of the larva of Agrillus bigotatus and the necrotic lesion. And in this picture, you can actually see the fresh spread, the bacteria doing their damage, spreading out, spreading out freshly from that lesion. In this picture, I know it's a little bit small, but those of you that are really eagle-eyed uh, may be able to see a slightly creamy, shiny look uh, on, onto that panel, and that is just all the bacteria that are busy working away there. Other external symptoms, when you go closely in, you will see that actually there's a crack between the bark plates and that the dark blue bleeds or fluids come through from that fissure with the cracks. And quite often you will see the D-shaped exit hole of this lovely little beetle, um, Agrillus bigotatus. Now, if you compare that with chronic oak decline, we're still very much working on the whole concept of what chronic oak decline is. But at the moment, the current thinking is that it's driven by poor root health, and that poor root health can be attributed to um, things like uh, Phytophthora infections, honey fungus or armillaria infections, and the uh, old currency name, Calibia, the new currency is Gymnopus. And it's quite diagnostic really in the crown when you see these, you'll see the, this dieback, the shedding of the fine twigs, the branches get a stubby look to them. And just as a comparison, for the uh, bleeds. If you look at this picture here, you can see there's quite a big spacing between those bleeds on the tree. Whereas in this case, this chronic uh, oak decline where our malaria was the main culprit, you will see that the bleeds actually emanate from each and every fissure between those bark plates. And quite often it's in an A-shaped frame going from the base up. These are sort of symptoms that can help you diagnose them. 
So this is just a sort of a conceptual model about the relationship between these two. Um, at the moment, our definition of AOD is that it's largely on the above ground parts of the tree. We see those symptoms on the stems mostly, uh, going up into uh, branches in the crown perhaps. And quite often we saw, we do see a sort of rapid rate of decline. But of course, the good news with AOT is that it's not always uh, a one a one way street for it. And we do see quite a large proportion of affected trees going either into remission or indeed even recovering. Um, and but the, the the big problem with that we we are seeing that in some cases where the tree has fought back and is callousing over these wounds and so on, as the new phloem is laid down, you can get reinfection in that new phloem. Um, and so so that's the issue with with AOD. Unfortunately, COD with this uh, attack going on on the roots, it seems that first of all, it's a slow rate of decline. You seem to get spread within the tree sort of from root to root or around that collar area of the tree. It appears to be a lot more of a one way street for it. And very often it ends in death. Now, considering that AOD attacks above ground and COD below ground, obviously they could be both going on at the same time, in which case we anticipate we would have very rapid rate of decline ending in death most likely. And um, at the same time, we also don't know whether AOD would start first and lead into COD or whether COD would be a lead into AOD. These are these are still very large questions that, uh, you know, that require answering. So I'm just going to give you a very, very quick summary of uh, the, the past 10 years of research that sort of led us to the point of understanding where we are now. And essentially, if you have a look at the first panel in the top corner here, uh, that was discovering the symptoms, recognizing it, diagnosing it, describing it. Uh, and once we knew that we were working with a distinctive condition, the road was open actually. What was quite surprised us was the fact that we isolated bacteria consistently from this. Um, and when we uh, tried to identify those bacteria, we found that many of them were new to science. And so that gave off about uh, five to eight years of just describing a number of different species. But we did find that consistently there were three different species of bacteria that were associated with those lesions. And these are Gibsiella quercinecans, uh, Brunneria goodwinii, and Ranella victoriana. Once we had found uh, these bacteria, we needed to um, prove their cause or, or, or what they were doing in the lesion, you know, in the lesions. And to do that, we did two things. We did pathogenicity tests with log trials that you can see here, and also inoculated trees. But we also did whole genome sequencing of these bacteria. Now, the whole genome is really uh, like the recipe book of, of a bacteria, but it tells the potential that this bacteria has to perform certain life functions. So once we had done that and we could see that the bacteria had the potential to cause rotting of, of, back, uh, of oak tissue, we then went into uh, the field and we actually analyzed those lesions on a DNA and an RNA basis called transcriptomics. And what we could find is that we could see these damaging genes actually being present in those lesions. And so we could map back the relationship to that. What we also found interesting though is that a number of the host genes were upregulated and these were all defense genes. So this gave us really, uh, you know, thoroughly convincing evidence that these bacteria are involved. Now, we also needed to know where the disease was occurring in the UK and we carried out surveys and we were able to map where they are. But we needed to know quite a lot about the role of agrilis as well. Now, those of you that know anything about agrilis, a number of entomologists here today will know that it's a cryptic little beetle and it spends most of its life cycle underneath the bark 
of AOD, where it feeds as a larvae for two years before it emerges as an adult. But what we were able to do is we were able to get records, known records of where the beetle occurred in the UK. And of course, we had our records of where AOD occurred and their distribution fitted hand in glove, giving quite a good uh, steer on the fact that the beetles could be involved in, in AOD. But we needed to you know, work even more with that. And so we had to try and capture those beetles and rear them in captivity. And this week work was done by Katie Reed under the guidance of Dagan Inwood. And so we've, we've progressed. This is the first in the world as well, where we've been able to uh, rear this beetle through its entire life cycle in the lab. But we are very dependent on this material that we get every spring. You know, so we're, we're probably seeing emails and, you know, people asking, please, can you help us look out for trees that are suitable? And we get the slab wood in, put it in these insect emergence cages. And when the adults come out, we then breed them in the laboratory. So I've sort of taken you through this interdisciplinary approach that we've been following. We've defined the causes and so on. We are looking at how these actually take place using molecular omic techniques. We're also looking at the host and how it's responding. We've uh, done the spatial uh, epidemiology and the modeling. And so now we're going to focus a little bit more on that. But obviously, there's all the management and the stakeholder uh, that we're involving as well. So the thing that underpins predisposition is the fact that trees need water and nutrients to grow. And predisposition factors are linked to water and nutrient availability. And invariably, if there's an impeded uptake, this causes deficiencies and imbalances. The moment that you get that happening, the tree responds and it affects the tree's health status. Trees become weakened or stressed, and so they become more vulnerable to uh, diseases. So we really wanted to find out the question, are there any identified predisposition drivers associated with AOD and COD sites? And to do that, we had all of our mapping, as I told you about, but we also have access to these magnificent databases where we collect or is collected nationally all sorts of climatic parameters like temperatures, rainfall, uh, atmospheric deposition, that's pollutant uh, things and so on, soil types and all of that. And so we were able to take that information and transpose this onto our distribution maps. And what we found at the national scale is that AOD tended to occur in warmer areas with low rainfalls, low elevations, but also where we've got high nitrous oxide deposition, so high pollutant deposition, and interestingly, much lower sulfur deposition. Um, and so really, this is this whole thing moving towards uh, drought stress and weakening. So here's just a little bit of uh, some detail to show you there, but I'm not going to dwell on it because time is, is moving on. But we do have that available if you need it. What we were able to do from that, we were then able to map the probability of AOD occurring. And you'll be very pleased to see that in the southwest, there's generally a, a fairly low probability, other than as you start to get a bit more uh, so central south and, of course, more up towards the eastern areas of, of Wales. So to come back to uh, the, the work that we're doing on, um, on predisposition and on the uh, soil factors, we've already seen at a national scale that there are factors, predisposing factors, but we wanted to look at this now on a more localized level. And so we had these uh, sites that we have monitoring data for over the last while. We sampled trees taking foliage samples and doing the biochemical analyses with those. We took soils and root samples and did all of the analyses on, on that. So I'm just put this slide up so that you can get a bit of an appreciation of the extent 
of the work that was done. It was absolutely enormous. So we looked at foliage, the morphological and the chemistry of it. We looked at the feeder roots, morphology and chemistry. We did it at uh, four different, uh, well, three, uh, two different depths, but looking at live and dead roots. We looked at soils uh, and the chemistries of pH, all their, their other factors. And then we did the chemical analyses for all those different uh, elements that you see listed there. So it was really quite a spectacular undertaking. And what we found is that there were significant differences between AOD trees uh, or trees affected by AOD and healthy trees. And what we tended to find is that the soils around the feeder roots of AOD trees tended to have a lower pH. And so there was a bit of acidification going on. In many cases, we started to see quite high levels of aluminium happening. And sometimes it was very high, even reaching toxic levels. We saw that there was cation uh, depletion. So these are essential um, elements that are necessary for cell function and uh, tree, normal tree function. We saw that there was also often quite higher stone content in the rooting zone. And what this gave off was that there was a lower root feeder root density, lower root biomass, fewer root tips and fewer branching. There was also lower carbon and water holding capacity of the soil and that the leaves themselves, the area was actually smaller, but they tended to be thicker and a bit harder. So there was a similar sort of a biomass and we could definitely see a lower uptake of really essential elements like nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium and potassium. And so the little uh, picture on the left hand side of the screen will demonstrate about how the, you get these high levels of nitrogen through fall coming through the canopy and all the different things that we found, which I have, have just explained. So one of the models that we think is happening in, in some tree, trees that suffer from AOD, I will be careful to say not all at the moment, but in some, is that we seem to be having this excess nitrogen and higher nitrification rates. And this seems to be driving a bit of soil acidification. And although these, um, these systems are very complex, one of the chemical reaction that appears to have high potential is the release of aluminium ions. And this sort of sudden increase of aluminium ions tends to reduce the cation availability. And it also, uh, high levels of aluminium contribute to feeder root toxicity. Of course, the high stone content uh, and high soil compaction in, inhibit feeder root growth. And together, these factors contribute to diminished feeder root capability and water and nutrient uptake. So soil acidification seems to be uh, one of the models that our work has uh, shown. And so I just want to finish off by saying that at the smaller scales, we've obviously observed this nutrition uh, imbalance and that there are these drivers. Low soil water holding capacity and sensitivity to drought are prevailing factors. But the other one is this acidity, which seems to be quite a good model uh, that's taking place and also the poor feeder root development, which is all linked to, again, to nutrient uptake. I would say that we're only at the beginning of this work, really, and that more in-depth analyses are required. But I think that, um, you know, we've made quite significant um, progress. And so, uh, in conclusion, we actually have found predisposition factors that are associated with acute oak decline. The Backstick project, Backstop project is testing the effects of drought specifically. We have uh, submitted to another uh, grant proposal to look at the effects of high nitrogen, and we're hoping that, that we'll be lucky enough to get that. 
feeder root health is important, uh, but also all the aspects that support it. So the ectomycorrhizae uh, and the microbial or microbial interaction, those are all important. But, you know, I have to say thank you to all of you. Research is here to help, but without you and you helping us, we couldn't get there. So together we can make a difference. And thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. I hope you found that this has been helpful to you. And thanks, John. We'll see you again. That was absolutely, that was absolutely brilliant. brilliant. Thank you, Sam. Um, personally, personally, I find, I find it, it so reassuring, reassuring to have uh, uh, such knowledgeable experts helping protect the trees uh, and the forest. forest. Um, and there's, yeah, if there's one thing I've taken away from this whole series. It's, it's just how thankful um, yeah, we should be to to you guys in forest research and um, yeah, for, for helping. We haven't been any questions that have popped up uh, specifically, Sandra, um, but if anyone does have, we've just got, oh, uh, just reading some of them that are coming in now. Uh, did it, okay, so uh, Ian Turner, would you like to, to put, uh, turn yourself off mute and, and I think that's a question. Yes, it was a question for uh, Nick Fielding. It was really concerning the uh, minor used uh, kind of species that we could be looking at a bit more uh, so we kind of tried to build in resilience. Um, whether there was any kind of research done on the uh, kind of brood kind of rates of demycans in like American, uh, sorry, hybrid American spruce, uh, which is a you know cross variety serbian spruce and oriental spruce and the second question was i know that oriental spruce is highly susceptible to deep micans but how does that actually compare with norway spruce which you said was um, uh, more susceptible than sitka spruce okay um in in its natural range in dendroctus micans natural range oriental spruce is is its preferred host and honestly it, it does best if, if you like in that there since we did the work um several of these other species have started to appear on our radar but i i honestly am not in a position to give you an answer as to um how susceptible or not they would be because i haven't really seen enough evidence of dendrochnus attack in those sort of woodlands. Um, Sitka, which is obviously well out of its natural, of dendrochnus's natural range, is very susceptible and dies very quickly. Norway spruce uh, is, can be killed, obviously is killed quite regularly, but is not as susceptible as Sitka. Oriental spruce, same sort of situation. Some of the others, others may well in the future be less susceptible but I but at the moment I'm not in a position where I could comment on that sorry great okay, thank you very much uh there's a quick question for you Sandra is there a difference between the oak species for for decline that, that's a really good question so the two native oak species uh, at the moment, we don't see a difference, but they are both susceptible. Um, and I have seen AOD pretty severely on uh, on some of our sessile oak. So, yeah, uh, you know, even though quite often they tend to be maybe a bit further north, you know, and we would think maybe a bit um, more resilient to it. But no, I've seen it pretty badly on that. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so we're now at the end. Uh, Dave, you got your hand up, but I think that was your question we just asked there. So um, yeah, just just to wrap just to uh, wrap up by saying, if you do have any questions about your trees, please use the Tree Alert app. Um, this is sort of the website rather than app. Sorry, um, that's the best place because that does go straight to the experts who you've been talking to us through throughout the course of the this month. Um, and I think it's if there's one takeaway message is to think about putting the right tree in the right place because a healthy tree can fight back against the uh, the pests and diseases that uh, that are afflicting them all but to just finish up today a massive massive thank you to max nick and sandra for giving up your time uh, it's been hugely great to hear from you uh, thank you for the audience for for dialing in 
Um, the recording will be posted if anyone wants to listen back. But uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers.